The Architectural Guide, Sub-Saharan Africa is a groundbreaking anthology bringing together more than 300 international authors, including leading architects from Africa and beyond, with the goal of presenting the richness and diversity of the Sub-Saharan African built environment through the most comprehensive documentation of the region's buildings across all architectural periods. Using this compendium as a basis for discussion, two of the publication's editors will discuss reframing theory and the presentation of Sub-Saharan Africa's architectural landscapes, delving into the driving factors behind the almost seven year journey this book, since this book's conception to its completion. Our first speaker is Adil Dalbia, studied both architecture and historic and cultural theory and works between architectural practice, research on architectural history and theory. Adil works as an author and editor for Dawn Publishers and is an architect for the architectural office in Berlin, specialized in international projects in Africa and Asia. He publishes and writes about architecture and urbanism in Africa and Eastern Europe, Central Asia. Our second speaker, Livingston Mukasa, his career has included architectural practice, urban design, real estate development, and sustainable development consulting. Born in Kampala, Uganda, he is the principal of Mahali, a collaborative design studio. He is a frequent architectural guest critique and reviewer, and has written and published articles about architecture and the built environment in Africa. Both Adil and Livingstone are 2021 Graham Foundation grantees and co-editors of the Architectural Guide, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Theorizing and the and theorizing architectural in sub-Saharan Africa perspectives, questions, and concepts, both published by Dom Publishers. And our moderator for this afternoon's lecture is Dr. Elizabeth Pigu Dennis. She is a social historian who examines various aspects of material culture in Jamaica. She is now an associate professor in architectural history and theory and vice dean at the Faculty of the Built Environment, University of Technology, Jamaica. Dr. Pigu Dennis's research includes the history of suburban bungalows, Rastafarian spatial iconography, cast and wrought iron in architecture, the townscape of Port Antonio, Creole architecture in the 19th century, and rebuilding King Street after the 1907 earthquake. Her book, Slums and Suburbs, Living in Kingston, Jamaica, 1914 to 1945, is impressed with Arawak publishers. Thank you, uh, Jordan, for the invitation and uh, Bonita for the kind introduction. And in general, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to talk uh, about architecture in Sub-Saharan Africa today. And more specifically, we want to share our experiences working on this publication, the Architectural Guide Sub-Saharan Africa. We, that is Livingston and I, together with Philip Moise, were the editors uh, of this publication. And for today, our aim is to highlight some aspects of architecture and architectural, architectural production on the African continent, and more, important, more importantly, the modes and challenges and different ways to document it, to write about it, and to theorize it, drawing on our experience with this book. Next slide, please. When it comes to finding, published resources on architecture in Africa. There's very little out there compared to what you would find elsewhere. Existing published resources covering architecture in Africa generally include scholarly publications, um, and these tend to be very specialized, very niche uh, topics. We then have magazines and travel books, almost no architectural guides. Um, in mass media, there's hardly anything. Occasionally, you'll hear about a humanitarian project or a new museum by somebody like David Ajay. Once in a while, very high profile magazines would publish special editions on Africa, but this work is almost always focusing on architects from the West. Very rarely do we see portraits of African architects and barely anything on contemporary African architectural production. Online resources aren't that much better off. Um, they tend to feature schools or hospitals or small scale projects or very glossy development projects. 
And just to give you an example, Arch Daily is one of the leading websites. It covers architectural, global architectural projects. In 2019, our research showed that only 0.9% of all their architectural projects were from sub-Saharan Africa. Now compare this to a country like Belgium, which is only a population of 11 million people, but yet they had 1.6% of the total architectural Arch daily uh, coverage of projects. This slide shows you some of the published books um, on architecture in Africa. The first row is mostly traditional or vernacular architecture. The second row shows architecture that is regional or place specific. On the third row, we have contemporary architecture and the fourth row is a much broader collection. Most of these titles are published either in the West or by scholars who are from the West or resident in the West. So when it comes to architectural publishing, the question arises, who gets published and who gets left out? Next slide, please. And then there's the dearth of African architectural resources within Africa itself. On the left side, on the left side of uh, the image um, is a bookshelf at a private architectural school in Yaoundé, Cameroon. Uh, the name of the school is Ekasa, which, Esaka, sorry, which stands for École Supérieure Spéciale d'Architecture de Cameroon. And uh, this picture was taken inside the architecture library and shows you the texts and periodicals that they have on African architecture. But the continent is a place of contrasts and contradictions. In many cases, there is little relevant information in places you expect to find it. And in other cases, there's an abundance in places where you least expect. For example, the image on the right, which is an image that you're likely to find almost anywhere on the continent. Um, but the question is the nature of the information itself. How relevant is it? Next slide. For the project we're going to talk about, we tried to find precedence. And these three texts were worth mentioning. The first one is African Architecture by Namdi Ele, who is the head of the architecture program at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. This was a landmark book that presented the first complete and definitive study of African architecture from antiquity to the present and defined indigenous, Islamic, and the Western roots of African architecture. And it went on to examine how these roots affect and influence the architecture of each region. Uh, the middle image is a book by David Ajay, which was a mix of travelogue and architectural study that tracked his journeys across 53 African cities in an effort to photograph and document the continent's built environment. This volume featured plenty of photography and numerous interesting structures, plus his views on them. The third book that we found interesting was by a Swiss historian and architect, Manuel Herz. Um, this book, African Modernism, chronicled the decade of the 60s and 70s, which was a very exciting era for architecture on the continent. This was the post-independence era, and there was a flowering of experimental and futuristic expression when these new African countries were trying to express their new identities. This book captured the raw and daring modernism of the post-colonial African era in countries like Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Kenya, and Zambia. Next slide, please. So now that you've heard a bit more about other publications on Africa's architecture, let's talk a bit more about our book. Back in 2014, Dom Publishers had just published uh, architectural guides about Cairo, Egypt, and, and South Africa. And at the same time, we had been working on some architecture projects in Western Africa, because in, in fact, all three of us um, are practicing architects and at the same time also writing about architecture. So when we did research for these projects, we were equally shocked and surprised, as Lix already described, to see how little literature there was available um, on Sub-Saharan Africa and its architecture. And that's why we started to develop the idea of publishing a book about all of Sub-Saharan Africa between Cairo and Cape Town. The initial plan was to edit one volume, actually, of maybe 400 pages within one or two years. 
But after six or almost seven years, we ended up with uh, seven volumes and more than 3,000 pages. Next slide, please. So now we're going to talk about the aims and the audience. Um, this image was taken, well, is, is taken in Yaoundé, Cameroon. Actually, it's not too far from where Adil is uh, right now. Um, this is a picture that shows the contrasts and the multiplicities of the African built environment. It shows the coexistence of multiple distinct parts. And it is within this context that we viewed the aims of this project. Next slide. Africa's architectural landscape is incredibly diverse and our goals were not to ignore these contrasts, uh, but broaden the narrative, um, include diverse views in a polyphonous way. The projects explored in this book cover a broad spectrum. On the bottom row, for example, you see three images and these show the diversity in just one country alone, Ethiopia. On the left, you have the Dutch embassy building, which draws its inspiration from the 12th and 13th century rock-hewn castles and rock-hewn churches, sorry, of Lalibela. In the middle, you have thatched wattle and daub homesteads and granaries of the Konzo people. And on the right, you have the contemporary African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa, which interestingly enough is referred to by locals as the Chinese building. That's because it was built uh, by the Chinese government and offered as a gift. The three images on the top represent architecture and the various ways that architecture contributes to the coexistence between people and water in, in West Africa. You have the Makoko Floating School in Lagos, uh, Nigeria, and stilt houses in Gambier, uh, Benin, and the uh, Megalomiac Echo Atlantic project built on reclaimed land in Lagos. Next slide. Geographically, Sub-Saharan Africa consists of all African countries and territories that are fully or partially south of the Sahara Desert. We decided to focus on this region and each one of its 49 independent countries, specifically because the architecture of North Africa or the areas that are north of the Sahara are more documented and um, you re those resources are fairly more easily accessible. In addition to exposing the architecture of this region to an international audience, our aims were to include as many authors as possible, writing about architecture in their own countries as seen through their eyes and experiences. Our goals were also to build connections within Africa and between these countries. The audience for this book is as wide as, as the goals. Um, it covers architects, scholars, travelers, interested people, um, students as well. Next slide, please. And now we want to briefly introduce you to the uh, publication's scope, concept, and structure. And here you can see some general facts and statistics. Some info is more anecdotal. For instance, uh, we mentioned that we worked on it more than six years. And for instance, we exchanged 15,000 emails um, with the contributors. Um, others are basic facts around the scope of the project. We sourced more than 5,000 photographs, and as already mentioned, more than 300 author authors were uh, contributing uh, texts to the book. Livingston will tell you more about them later. And in total, more than 650 people contributed to the project in one way or another, be it with contacts or information about buildings or photos or assistance during our many trips. Next slide, please. Um, now, a few words about the structure of the publication. Um, we've divided the, the publication into seven volumes. Beside the, besides the introduction volume, which we're going to talk about a bit later, there are six geographically organized volumes, each um, or with a chapter on each of the 49 sub-Saharan countries. Uh, next slide, please. Um, considering the evident diversity and the enormous differences of the 49 featured countries, it was especially important to us to find a common structure for each chapter to guarantee that readers can navigate easily through the 4,000 pages, but also to offer a certain comparability between the countries and the chapters, which, uh, yeah, this was one of the main aims also of the project. 
So why country chapters? Because of course there are many alternative possible structures, but to our project countries or nation states seem to be the most suitable to manage the sheer amount of featured projects and to overcome also the cliche of Africa as one country, because in fact it is 54 countries or in our case, because we're just looking at Sub-Saharan Africa, 49 countries. So there are four main elements to each of the 49 chapters. Each chapter starts with a short introduction article, a brief overview over the country's architectural history and its contemporary building culture. The central element of each chapter are documentations of buildings and projects. Thirdly, there are in each uh, chapter city portraits. And in addition to that, always at least one, usually more background articles or essays. Next one, please. Since our publication is an architectural guide, um, as I said, one of the main elements um, are the documentations and descriptions of buildings and projects. Usually there are between 10 for the smaller countries and 30 in bigger countries uh, in each chapter. And the aim was to have a selection of representative and typical buildings, but also everyday architecture and some hidden gems. There were no restrictions in terms of typologies. Um, we were very open for, for our contributors' suggestions, hence the white spectrum as seen here on the, on the diagram on the left. Um, some examples of this, how it looks like, you can see on the right with these three uh, pages from the book. Um, we tried to cover all architectural periods, which makes this publication, I think, quite special because it is truly, or it was truly meant as a cross section through the, the built realities of Africa. Next one, please. But of course, architecture is not just individual buildings. It's always found in, in specific contexts and it's embedded and reacting to spatial structures and surroundings. And that's why every chapter includes this mentioned city portraits, uh, more than 70 in total. Usually it's the capital city and other major cities of the country. And they consist of short texts and um, hand-drawn maps which you can see here a few examples of. Um, next one, please. And last but definitely not least, there are over 200 articles because as I said, architecture is always more than just the, the sum of individual buildings. So we try to include uh, many different types and genres for these um, articles or essays. Uh, there are photo essays, there are interviews with the key players of the country's architecture scene, for instance, with uh, Maliam Doko in Malawi. Then there are texts about activists and NGOs or local architectural media projects, because we think it's important also to show the people behind uh, the, the uh, architecture. Then there are historical articles focused on specific eras to provide critical background information and context to buildings. For instance, here about historical colonial forts in Ghana and their connection to the transatlantic slave trade. Other articles focus on internal and external influences to the respective country, for instance, the influence of China or historically speaking, the Soviet Union or North Korea. Then there are also not country specific articles like on the relation of architecture and development cooperation, as you can see here on the third uh, image preview. We also included portraits of important and influential architects and the essays were also a good way to have more in-depth analysis of projects or to focus on specific typologies. For instance, here on the lower right, you can see a, an article about a vernacular typology in Sao Tome called Kubatas. Next one, please. And yeah, as I've said, these essays also were a good way to analyze and explain urbanistic projects beyond the scale of individual buildings or to discuss recent trends and to go deeper and uh, yeah, to discuss recent trends and, and um, uh, events in, in the country's architecture. For example, here, you see a photo from the Seychelles um, because in the Seychelles chapter, we included a, uh, an article, a critical assessment of an urban development project, uh, Eden Island, which is aimed mostly towards tourists. The next one, please. And in this article, the author also discusses the possibilities of a modern take on traditional Creole architecture, as is seen uh, in this example, with, which is branded as a uh, contemporary Creole uh, 
uh, architecture, for example, of contemporary Creole architecture. Um, yeah, next slide, please. One of the most important aspects of this project was working on agency, deciding who should we include, who should we exclude. We cast a very wide net regarding the kinds of contributors we sought. This collection included architects, scholars, historians, sociologists, geographers, photographers, journalists, students, activists, and we had to form a balance between the young and, and the old, the newcomers versus the star architects. And this wasn't without its challenges. It was very hard to keep soliciting and keep finding the appropriate types of contributors. And that's also because of the 49 countries, no two are the same. Um, the continent is very diverse in socioeconomic conditions or political conditions. Um, so where in some countries it was relatively easy to find experts and, and professionals in other countries, particularly ones that are emerging from conflict, um, errors. It was very hard. Um, agency was important. Um, determining how to give voice to those who are typically unheard of in these discussions. Language was another barrier too. Um, we solicited texts in three languages, French, English, and Portuguese, uh, that all had to be translated. On the left, you see a breakdown of authors by gender, as well as the number of authors that we had from different continents. And on the right are images of um, Adil and, and myself uh, meeting with different authors. Next slide, please. So one of the primary goals was to introduce to the world new faces, new voices via a multilateral, multilingual, cross-cultural and cross-continental global effort. This is one of my favorite slides uh, or favorite images uh, from the book. And it's a visual display of all these wonderful faces of the 338 authors whose texts constitute the seven volumes. Next slide, please. And from this group, we were very fortunate to have our moderator for this afternoon's discussion. Professor Elizabeth Pigu Dennis from the Caribbean School of Architecture was very kind to share some of her unique insights in our volume one, um, a section titled Towards a Theory of African Architecture. We were very grateful for her participation. Next slide. Now, um... Uh, I'll talk about some of the experiences that we want to share uh, about the process of organizing, researching, and editing such an ambitious project, and some of the practical challenges we faced along the way. The first step um, when we made the, the plan um, was, of course, to research the countries and their architectures ourselves, checking the existing literature, uh, then followed by networking and reaching out to potential authors to identify a what we call country coordinator to coordinate the country chapter who were supposed to select the projects and would write about them either themselves or find additional authors and so we in berlin and new york where livingston is um would uh, coordinate the work of the chapter coordinators <laughs> um this was the ideal plan but of course the reality was uh, often different it was not subsequent steps what i've just described but since there are 49 countries it was essentially 49 different projects to manage simultaneously but all in different stages of completion and over the course of the six almost seven years although this was not explicitly planned as there was no budget for this actually um, but thanks to the participation in, in conferences and some business trips related to our architectural projects, we were able to do uh, quite a few trips and uh, also meetings and presentations in many African countries. As you can see here in the map, between the three of us, Philip Livingston and I, um, we've uh, visited almost half of the countries ourselves. And that's why here you see also in the background a, a photo of um, a trip in Western Africa, I think it was, uh, in Benin maybe. Yeah, it was Benin. Um, but more often it would involve, of course, flying around and above all video conferences and phone calls as illustrated by the two little screenshots here. 
Next slide, please. Here are two examples of um, country chapters um, with a list of featured projects because the selection of the um, buildings and projects came also with some conceptual challenges. First, who would choose the buildings? As I said, the, the country coordinators um, were supposed to do this with the authors, but since there was not always a country coordinator in, in many, actually most cases, we are also ourselves had to get involved, sometimes quite intensively. And um, on occasion, even researching uh, and, and writing about the buildings ourselves. And secondly, um, this concerned also the relation between local, often more practical exp uh, expertise and academic research. Because we had prepared some clear guidelines for the building documentations and provided all authors with examples. Um, but in the end, it was uh, more important to find a, a balance. So each chapter had to find its own tone and, and focus in a way. Next slide, please. One priority for us was to have projects that represent the reality of African cities with their extreme contrasts to show the, the glossy and fancy projects, um, but also the realities of, of slums and shanty towns. And here's one of the most extreme examples, Luanda, the capital of Angola, with its exclusive, exclusive uh, beachfront and harbor development. Uh, on the one hand, and the extensive uh, musekes, the, um, the slums are called in, in Luanda, on the other, which uh, make up the biggest part of the city and where the majority of the urban population resides. Next slide, please. Some other of the practical challenges that we were facing. Um, firstly, of course, it was the sheer scope project to communicate um, with, with all of the authors, to co coordinate their contributions, um, to uh, harmonize them to a certain uh, degree. And uh, also we and the, our copy editor, we spent more than a year just with proofreading and fact checking, because indeed fact checking was one of the biggest uh, practical challenges. As an example, I've chosen this um, photo here of a, of a bank building in Bissau. Um, I I've, I've saw the building when I was uh, visiting the city and I uh, heard about it from um, local architects whom I've met there, that it was built in the 80s. Um, but there was barely any literature on the post-colonial architecture of, uh, of Guinea-Bissau or in general of, of African uh, countries. Um, and it was not practical or possible to go to an archive only for one building, um, considering we have yeah, more than 800 uh, buildings and projects featured. So we did a lot of research uh, online and other publications, but always found very contra contradictory information because, um, and this just to illustrate that in general, um, that uh, concrete information on buildings was scarce, wrong, um, and contradictory at times, which made research quite difficult. Also problematic sometimes was the secretiveness of some architects themselves actually, because um, uh, many were not willing to share information or, or, or images of their work. And of course, one of the biggest challenges was um, financing because the entire project was financed independently, which uh, made us free from external influences, but uh, also of course caused many problems um, because there was low or no remuneration. So this was de facto a nonprofit project. Next slide, please. Architecture is about storytelling, but with every story, equally important is who's telling the story and whose story is being told. We examined how to depict and present architecture in Africa, what constitutes balance, especially in light of the existing publications that we mentioned in the beginning. We had to consider both the quality of the projects as well as the actual texts. And this was especially important given the diverse authors with diverse backgrounds. This also raised questions like, which, which standards do we apply? We also tried to have balance between showcasing critical um, insights while raising the profile of burgeoning architectural activism on the continent in countries like Ghana, Benin, and Eastern Africa and Southern Africa. Input from professional architectural associations and professional organizations was desired and solicited, and we were fortunate to have that participation. Regarding images and visualization, 
we aimed for different aesthetics, a balance of stunning photography and an interesting mix of important projects without great visual value, but important social, historical, political or ecological value. This slide shows the variety of, of projects that we sought to include, a mix of vernacular versus um, uh, projects by architects and, and planners, uh, building projects versus urban settlements and architectural heritage projects, like for example, um, the Pyramids of Meroe, which are the oldest um, uh, buildings featured in this publication. While the emphasis was on built architecture, there were a few instances where renderings were also used to help illustrate upcoming buildings that were considered significant. This, these photographic goals presented challenges too. Um, we had a lot of difficulty sourcing photography in some countries. For example, Adil just mentioned previously how secretive certain architects were. Um, there were also practical problems um, with taking photographs. We had cases where our authors or photographers were detained or arrested for taking photographs of public buildings. This was mainly in countries where you know security was 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 a problem, and then there were you know conditions like infrastructure or bad internet access or no archives that uh, further prohibited our photographic goals. Next slide, please. When looking at so-called traditional or vernacular architecture, it was important to present it holistically, taking into consideration the cultural and traditional context within which spatial organization, forms, and aesthetics emerge, and not just display it in isolation from these factors. We paid particular attention to how these buildings reflect their historical era. What made them distinctive both then and now, and what they tell us about the people who built them, the people who use them. This image is taken inside one of the most famous buildings in, in Uganda, in Eastern Africa. It's inside Muzibu Azala Mpanga, which is a former palace and royal tomb, which enshrines the last four kings of the Buganda kingdom. This was built in 1882, and the building is an interesting case study of the role played by cultural beliefs in determining architecture. For example, the thatched roof is supported by 52 circular rings made from palm fronds. The number 52 is not arbitrary. There are 52 clans of the Bagand people, and these rings symbolically give each clan presence over the resting place of their kings. In addition to the structural purposes, the columns are not random either. They're positioned to represent a sacred forest, bringing the indoors, bringing the outdoors indoors to help deter those with evil intent towards the graves. Next slide. The architecture of the majority of people, the everyday architecture that everyday people interact with was also important to depict. This is architecture that you never tend to see in magazines or, or books. It is the architecture that people drive by without looking twice. This often uncelebrated architecture is actually the reality of the vast majority of inhabitants throughout all African countries. So we chose specifically not to discount it. And it was important to consider what informed its creation, be it resource scarcity or regulatory scarcity. These images are from Conakry in Guinea, uh, showing different types of single and multifamily housing and mixed use buildings. Next slide, please. Here is an example where renderings were used. The small East African nation of Rwanda is one of the smallest countries in mainland Africa, but it's a country that really punches above its weight architecturally and successfully utilizes architecture as a tool for economic development. These images were taken from the 2010 master plan for the capital, Kigali. The rendering shows the main roundabout in Kigali that, was, that has plans of being transformed into an elevated pedestrian public space and circulation. 
the inserted image, uh, which is a little small, you might not be able to see it very clearly, shows the building typologies that are placed within the hilly terrain of Kigali. Next slide. But architecture isn't only about buildings. Architecture is also about laws and planning policies, the histories of them and the legacies of them. Here we see the effects of such laws in Blue Bosrand, South Africa. Same neighborhood, but two vastly different spatial experiences. Next slide, please. Now that we've seen different methods and challenges when it comes to presenting African architecture, there are also important conceptual or theoretical questions to consider that go beyond the actual architecture in, in the narrow sense. Africa is a continent with a very particular history, which is not only reflected in its uh, built environment, but also in the way it has been written and talked about since the times of colonialism. And of course, we also um, wrote a um, particular story of the continent's architecture. That's why it was important for us to reflect this story, the underlying narratives, and also our own cliched views and biases sometimes, meaning also our own role as editors and authors. But these questions also concern the terminology uh, to find an appropriate language of architectural writing um, and to find ways um, or, yeah, to find out ways uh, to, to overcome colonial modes of think thinking and speaking when it comes to representations of African architecture. Next slide, please. These theoretical considerations also raise the question of Africa's role in global architecture. What are appropriate ways to discuss it and depict this? And that's why I uh, chose this um, painting by architecture students from Cameroon. But more fundamentally, um, it also raised the question, what is Africa or African when we speak about African architecture? And also the term of architecture itself, um, what should be included and how wide should the definition be? And is it actually fully applicable to an African context or are there other meanings or, or words to describe the built environment of the continent? In the introductory volume, these questions are discussed in, in depth, um, which theoretical implications and limitations are to be considered in any attempt to document the diversity and the, the differences and contrasts of an entire continent. Another example of what I mean is this uh, monument in Bissau, shown here on the right, um, which I think shows the ambivalences of African independence and colonial persistence crystallized in, in one monument. It was built by the Portuguese colonial regime to honor the Portuguese colonial empire. After independence in 1973, it was renamed to Monument of the Heroes of Independence. The Black Star of Africa was added on the top. However, the Portuguese coat of arms is in place in the center of the monument, and many locals also still refer to it as Empire Statue. The next slide, please. Other important questions discussed are those of authenticity and emancipation. And of course, here too, there are many ambiguities that are important to consider when writing about architecture in Africa. For instance, underlying Eurocentric biases and the different awareness for sensitivities in Europe, the US, Africa, and the rest of the world. Just as an example, here you see the university building in Conakry. It was built in the 60s in the time's spirit of emancipation and liberation, just after independence from French colonial rule, with a mosaic celebrating black Prometheus who broke the chains of colonialism. It was designed and made by Soviet artists and refers to a very prominent Western and European mythological figure. And this is just to show or to illustrate how powerful Western narratives and tropes can also can be also while building and celebrating independent African states. Next slide, please. While we do not claim to have found the, the ultimate answers to these questions, obviously, we tried to face and discuss them in the first volume. 
And therefore we've invited renowned scholars and experienced uh, practicing architects to share their view on these questions and the possibilities and limitations of a theory or theories, plural, of African architecture. And also very proud to this included uh, this year's Pritzker uh, laureate, Francis Kerry. And um, this resulted in 49 short essays um, grouped into seven chapters, each with a specific focus, for instance, um, looking at theoretical aspects of the vernacular or architectural identity, architectural agency, or also to include global perspectives and the global African network. Next slide, please. Looking at the outlook, um, we had to really investigate the question of why is this important? Why are we doing this? Why is architecture in Africa relevant? Well, one way of looking at it is just by seeing how Africa's population is about to become a very definitive um, factor in how the world works. By the middle of this century, almost one quarter of humanity will be African. Nigeria will surpass the United States as the third largest country in the world, and Ethiopia won't be that far behind. The vast majority of these people will live in cities. And by the end of this century, five of the world's top, five of the world's 10 most populous cities will be in Africa with Lagos, Kinshasa, Dar es Salaam holding the top three spots. This presents enormous challenges and opportunities because this profession, architecture, is one that at its core responds and supports people's needs and adds value, dignity, and integrity to the human experience. But to do that, one must look at architecture as among other things as social science, one that is both informative and responsive to the human condition. It is important to look at this continent through a different lens because what happens in Africa does not stop at the edge of the continent. Africa's setbacks and, it, and advances, whether looking at issues like migration or mobile money, are reshaping how the world works. This project's journey evolved exponentially with the aim of demonstrating the vast range of African architecture, the different modes of its representation, the challenges and the questions associated with it. Despite the seven volumes and over 3,400 pages, this project remains neither complete nor a concise representation. There was far more left out than included. But there were many questions, both complementary and contradictory, that, that came up. And these included, where does contemporary architect, where do contemporary architects draw their inspiration from? How does African art, for example, in the image on the upper left, um, culture or vernacular, in, or vernacular architecture influence the creation of contemporary space? How is Africa's tangible and intangible heritage handled? How do these things manifest themselves in defining African aspirations, both locally and on the world stage? Africa's history also brings up a series of questions. What role do the plural and fluid identity formations play in the conception of Africa's architecture, especially if we take into consideration that these states remain largely artificial, considering that the borders were not drawn by Africans and were actually very violently drawn at that. We also looked at how is architecture used to define, celebrate, or control the nation state and along those lines, what role does architecture play to define authentic emancipation that leaves behind old tropes but doesn't necessarily exclude them either? The photo on the left is a mural in Ouagadougou, uh, Burkina Faso, on the building. It was made by North Korean artists. And you can see the evident contradictions when you look closely at, um, at that mural. We also looked at how architecture plays a role in, the, in suppression and oppression, not just by colonial governments, but by post-independence African governments. Regarding African education, how are 
the future, the continent's future architects being trained to address these questions, particularly within the context of a pedagogy that remains rooted in Western principles and precedents. How do you balance both academic and non-academic training in producing professionals that can address the continent's challenges? What roles do vocational training and artisanship play in this process? How do you elevate the role played by indigenous knowledge systems in the creation of the built environment? Also relevant is terminology. Are terms like vernacular architecture and traditional architecture, which only seem to be applied in the context of the global South, appropriate in defining in the defining of certain typologies, or are these terms outdated? The term architecture itself, how relevant is it in talking about a homegrown way and means of producing structure? There was also the realization that not all trained architects will get to design buildings, but that doesn't make them any less important. There are many other ways they can contribute to their country's built environment. We looked at things like how architects can be better trained in documentation and archiving and why this is important and how architects can move beyond designing and become actual custodians of their built environment. Why does architectural conservation matter as much as designing and building? Next slide, please. And lastly, there's the role of Africa's diaspora. In 1992, a book was published called African American Architects in Current Practice by African American architect Jack Travis. This book was published by Princeton Architectural Press. This was a groundbreaking book because it was the first thorough documentation on the work of African American architects anywhere. This book helps change the public face of architecture in the United States. 30 years later, we hope to build upon that disruption by bringing forth even more faces and voices. This project included a number of African-American architects ranging from the work of pioneering architects like J. Max Bond in Ghana to more contemporary architects like Mark Gardner's work in Tanzania. There are several more African-American voices, including a stirring essay by the late Philip Freelon and texts from Jack Travis, David Hughes, Amber Wiley, Charles H. Davis III, Maria Gooden, just to name a few. These two are Africa's architectural voices. But these conversations with the diaspora weren't limited to just the United States. This project included examples of African building traditions that survived the Middle Passage and are still in practice today throughout the Americas. From Kingston, Jamaica, for example, Elizabeth Pigou Dennis talks about a distinct Caribbean speciality that is derived from African tradition. And in Curitiba, Brazil, Karen Santos da Silva talks about the Quilombos, dwellings in the Brazilian hinterlands that have their roots in Angola. These conversations set the stage for further questions and explorations of the architectural linkages between Africa and the Western world. These explorations raise the question, what would the built environment of the Americas look like today if Black people had arrived over the centuries in the same numbers, not as enslaved people, but as immigrants? What kinds of African building traditions and aesthetics and aesthetic expressions within the Caribbean, America, and the global built environment are, as Jack Travis argues, hiding in plain sight. Next slide, please. This has been a long project, but it involved, and it has evolved exponentially from its original intent. Um, this was a global collaboration that went just beyond a book. It was a global network, perhaps the most diverse ever assembled to discuss architecture in sub-Saharan Africa. And both Adil and I were fortunate enough to be awarded a Graham Foundation grant to turn this into an actual publicly accessible online network that will take these conversations and research to wider audience, wider audiences. Of this cohort, um, the people that you're looking at on the screen, 52 are of African descent and 20% of all these authors were African women practicing in Africa. For some, it was their first time to write about contemporary architecture in their countries. For others, this process gave them agency not only to tell their own story, but explore unique perspectives and arguments that have never been published before. The goal for everyone was the same to showcase the multiplicities of architecture in a region that remains unknown to many. 
This has been a journey that we hope expands the canon of African architecture, exposing the discourse to a larger audience that will see it to be as rich, complex, multifaceted, and as worthy of critical scholarship as architecture from other regions. Next slide, please. Our biggest debt is owed to three authors who sadly passed away either just before the book was published or shortly afterwards. Um, Anthony Almeida is a Tanzanian architect. He's the one, the blown up image on the top. He was in 1950, the first Tanzanian national to open an architectural practice in Tanzania. He passed away in 2019 at the age of 98. Sandy Grant on the lower left, is a, was an architectural historian and heritage activist. He founded Botswana's first museum in 1979, and he was the recipient of Botswana's presidential order of honor in 2003. He passed away last year at the age of 84. And Philip Freelon, who's probably known to some of you, is a pioneering African-American architect, an architect of record for the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American History and Culture. He passed away in 2019 at the age of 66. These three gentlemen gave us their time and resources during a period of their lives when they had much larger priorities. They never got to see what would be their last published work and we remain immensely, immensely grateful for their invaluable input and would like to dedicate this lecture to their memory. Next slide, please. We're now at the conclusion of our presentation on documenting Sub-Saharan Africa's architectural landscapes. And we're, we are very grateful and thank the Caribbean Island City for providing us a platform to discuss this publication. And of course, a special thanks to all of you for giving us your time. And we look now forward to an interesting discussion first with Elizabeth and then uh, to all of your questions as well. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for a really compelling presentation. I think as an architect in the Caribbean, there's a lot to consider about the linkages between Sub-Saharan Africa and our experiences in the Caribbean as well, architecturally. Very astounding. I, I want to open the conversation up to the panel discussion right now between Adele Livingstone and Dr. Elizabeth Pigou Dennis. Well, thank you very much, um, Jordan, for inviting me to do this. Um, extreme thanks and appreciation and um, celebration of this immense work that Adil and Livingston and others managed to produce. It's very impressive. And although you spoke to a considerable extent about what made you, your decisions in the content. I had some a further question about how you, what guided you in the selection from such a huge array of possibilities, Adil, how did you hone in and decide what to put in? Uh, thanks, Elizabeth, for the for the kind of words and for this question. Um, yeah, indeed, we um, criteria or guidelines for authors and to coordinators. Um, so the selected project should be um, either representative and typical for their respective country, or be outstanding or unique in a way. And since the aim uh, was to feature projects from all periods, we suggested a ratio of of, of actual era project. So um, we always told our authors that uh, about 20% of the projects should be uh, traditional, pre-colonial, 30% um, should be early colonial or colonial modernist projects, and the remaining 50% uh, post-independence and contemporary buildings. And another aim, um, albeit less often achieved, was um, to, uh, yeah, to have a more or less equilibrated geographical distribution of the projects as well. Um, to, this means to have uh, selected projects from all parts of the respective countries, not just from the capital city. But um, this has proved often very difficult. Um, information, as we mentioned, uh, so traveling 
um, even to the capital was complicated enough in the first place, uh, let alone traveling to, to other cities or, or the countryside, especially in war-torn countries, which unfortunately there were some. Um, but besides this, the coordinators were, were given a lot of freedom because in the end, each chapter has uh, a character and is based on the author's or coordinator's personal and professional backgrounds. And because of course, we're always aware that um, every selection um, even of a, such a small number of, of buildings for an entire country could only be individual and subjective. And uh, yeah, maybe last but not least, I also have to be honest and acknowledge that there was also chance and coincidence that played a role. Um, because for instance, um, while we were traveling, we found an interesting project. We took a photo of it, started researching, or we met uh, someone, on, on, um, an architect who told us or recommended us another uh, interesting or typical uh, building. And also, actually, in, in some cases, um, we didn't have much choice uh, to begin with because of the lack of documentation and reliable sources. So in a few chapters, uh, we actually had difficulties to come uh, up even with 10 good, uh, not projects, but good descriptions and uh, the matching good high quality photographs. Um, so yeah, this is a kind of a, a mixture of these factors. Okay, thank you very much for that. I was really impressed as you spoke and talked about the difficulties that, you know, one might never have thought there were difficulties when we see these wonderful box seven volumes that look so effortless when you get it, but there was a tremendous amount of effort and even risk because you talk about going into conflict zones and places where photographers were arrested. That's that's highly challenging. So kudos to you and your team for that. I was particularly impressed with the use of traditional materials in contemporary contexts for contemporary spatial needs and functions. And in the context of your very recently published seven volumes, the work of Francis Carré the first Black winner of the Pritzker Prize, who for any of our audience members who may not know, the Pritzker Prize is the most prestigious architectural prize internationally. And in 2022, it was won by Francis Carey, architect originally from Burkina Faso in West Africa. So I think it's tremendous that at this juncture in time, um, I think it was Livingston towards the very end of the presentation mentioned what a force Africa will become in terms of sheer numbers, in terms of accomplishments. And your seven volumes and this Pritzker Prize, I think helps to pave the way for the world learning more from African practitioners, whether vernacular or professional. So thank you very much for that. Um, Livingstone, based on the coverage of these seven volumes, what would you say are the greatest challenges facing architectural practice on the African continent at this time? Um, very good question, Elizabeth. Thank you for that. There are many uh, challenges, but I, I would narrow I would narrow on the challenge of capacity, capacity across all spheres. Um, that probably remains the biggest hurdle. We identified close to 100 schools of architecture, for example, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, which on the surface sounds like many, but for a population of you know, over a billion people, it's hardly enough. Africa simply doesn't produce the numbers of architects required to meet the needs of this particularly rapidly growing and increasingly urbanized population. Um, in addition to this pipeline um, uh, challenge, um, deficits carry over into the regulatory and, and also the ancillary professional frameworks as well. In many places, there's an absence of adequate building codes, or when you do have codes, enforcement is, is really not um, extensive enough. Another challenge is architecture is typically approached from the top 
down where governments and bureaucrats are the decision makers and um, actual users are pushed to the periphery. This produces, in many cases, um, ambivalence and um, it reduces and eliminates the sense of collective ownership in, in buildings um, or in architecture and result, results in failed buildings that are seemingly out of place or leading to public apathy of the built environment. Okay, well that does sound in some ways similar to some issues we face in the Caribbean, which we may get back on that theme in a little while, but over to Adil again, um, several of the authors, such as Tomo Barlando in volume one, assert the impossibility of a single definition of African architecture. Do you consider this to be a problem or an opportunity? Thanks, Elizabeth. That's, uh, indeed, yeah, a good question because well, the short answer would be maybe neither, but instead more as a matter of course, or as a foundation of, of, of any understanding of architecture in Africa, because um, what I mean is, in, in my opinion, a, a single definition would inevitably require generalizations to a degree that uh, the entire definition would become meaningless or useless. And uh, besides, is, is, is there a single definition, for instance, of Asian architecture? Because Africa and its architecture, um, I think this was made very clear, are, are too diverse to to be lumped together into one uh, definition. And in fact, there are many different Africas and our African architectures, plural. So um, naturally, there are also many different definitions of what African architecture could be. And in that sense, maybe I, I, I would agree. If anything, it's also an opportunity indeed, because since every chance uh, to, to take on or consider different perspectives uh, is an opportunity to, to broaden the discourse include fresh voices and therefore learn more about the, the studied subject and um, the, yeah that's what we've tried to achieve also with, with volume one and the theory chapter as it was was not to give definite answers but to ask also a lot of questions 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 not just about the, the definition of African architecture but also about the um, the ways and the, the terminology uh, that we use to talk about it which is I think very fundamental or also the role, what Livingston talked about, the role and the position of architects in Africa and also of, of scholars who study architecture in Africa. And uh, yeah, we hope that these questions that uh, they will contribute to or stimulate architectural debate uh, worldwide, of course, but specifically also in Africa. And um, in the end, also Africa, um, the continent itself is, is always changing. So perhaps um, should be the definition of African architecture, a more fluid one maybe, and definitely not a single, uh, short definition as possible. Okay, thank you for that. As you mentioned questions, I remember that many years ago, a native Canadian architect, distinguished architect, Douglas Cardinal of the Blackfoot First Nations tribe, he was invited to the Caribbean School of Architecture to give a distinguished lecture. And one of the things he said, I will never forget, he said, Oftentimes people want to be an answering machine, but he always positioned himself to be a questioning machine, to ask questions all the time. And that, that has always stuck in my mind. So I appreciate what you're saying there. Um, did you have anything you wanted to jump in at this point, Livingston, before I moved on to the next? Um, yes, thought? I had to I, I actually had a, a question for you, uh, Elizabeth, um, given um, these, these linkages that we were discussing um, throughout this presentation between Africa and the regions of the African diaspora. Uh, specifically with the Caribbean, uh, people of African descent are the majority of the Caribbean population, yet the culture of Africa is, isn't immediately visible in the architecture that we see across the Caribbean. How would you reconcile this absence with the Caribbean having historically played an outsized role in the birthing of Pan-African intellectual thought and negritude? Um, 
and also considering the presence of African languages and cultural practices, some long extinct in continental Africa, that are alive in one form or another in parts of the Caribbean, Central and South America? Why does the architecture of Africa as a point of departure for contemporary design and research remain elusive? Okay, well, that's a very powerful question and one that we exercise our minds over quite a lot. Um, I have about two kind of quick answers to that, rather than, you know, give a whole lecture on it. Um, the obvious thing is that hegemonic role, which you have spoken about in terms of um, transatlantic slavery, and the way in which the knowledge chains of Africans were broken. But more significantly and a little bit paradoxically is something that a number of authors in your volumes mentioned is the high significance and role of the intangible in African architecture. So rather than all the meaning being put forth in the actual built form, the spaces itself and the relations between the people and maybe more subtle signals of what those specialities mean. Um, the kind of, um, let's say kinetic or haptic imitation of action and passing on through verbalizing as opposed to writing and publishing treatises. And it is the writing and publishing of treatises that helped Europeans to transfer their architectural ideas across that same Atlantic Ocean that the Africans were transiting, albeit in somewhat better conditions. But it is that break in the chains of transmission for imitation and for verbalizing by mixing up people of different languages and so forth that, that we have what looks like a creolization process that favors things that look like or are adaptations of European objects. But I could go further than that and say that that same intangibility has helped a the transference of things that we may not see at first sight, but which are there. For example, the yards, which we call tenement yards in the city, and which are rural family land and um, plots of land within the rural areas. And I think that that modality transferred itself and the, the tendency to settle in clusters, to recognize the feasibility and validity of communal use of open public spaces and to use outside spaces within the tropics, although it's a kind of different tropics in the Caribbean than all of Africa is not the same tropic. Some is wet, some is dry and you have temperate, but we, we have that capacity for fluidity between inside outside space. So that is why when I was asked, and I must say I was shocked when I got that email first at you, and I had to do some research to figure, I mean, is this for real? And it turns out it very much is for real. But when I thought about it, I thought the yard immediately came to, to my mind. And it is the case, take with the Maroons in the various Maroon settlements that when visitors go or when even our students go, we were there just two Sundays ago in Moortown, people complain why this just looks like everything else in Jamaica, they don't see anything African. And so they've considered maybe we should build some things that really look like, you know, it's thatch, it's wattle and daub and so forth. In fact, they did, but hurricane and storm kind of trash those. But the thing is, the funny thing is, is it that they in the Maroon settlements look like the rest of Jamaica or the rest of Jamaica is 
everybody's doing these things which we don't recognize because we're not looking exactly, but they're all drawing from a, a common root. One of the things that I am investigating is the tendency when using concrete to make these kind of etchings and symbols within the wall. And it's just my notion, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, that because it was wattle and daub rather than mud that the enslaved people were using, they weren't able to do those incisions. But when we moved to cement, you had a nice wet surface that people could put symbols. And they may not be recognizably African symbols, whatever those are, but that need to kind of make an impression on the surface of the wall. It's something I'm probing. I don't want to get too long-winded in my answer to you. Um, thank you for the question. Let me move on to ask Livingston, throwing it back in your court again. What do you consider to be the value of the architectural ideas and practices that have been showcased in these volumes for young Caribbean architects? Um, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you for your response too. Um, regarding the value, I'd, I'd say there, there, there are many. Um, you mentioned uh, Francis Carré, um, who we were, we were delighted uh, when he won this year's uh, Pritzker Award. Um, his, his work is, is a wonderful example where you find the use of local materials in, in very smart and innovative ways to respond to heat, uh, rainwater, material scarcity and, and other climatic conditions, offering a window into how architecture can and should adapt to, to its immediate context. These buildings are also cooperative in both function and, and creation. They are for and with communities and as a result, directly of those communities. Uh, so Kerry is, is just one example, but there are many other younger um, architects across the continent who are demonstrating the vast potential of localized approaches to, to architecture when combined with modern design and materials and modern construction uh, techniques produces uh, an architecture that is far more representational um, than uh, what is typically seen. And so I, I think that's something that um, students in the Caribbean could, could borrow from. The other area is that of identity which is a recurring theme throughout these volumes. Um, in both practice and, and academia, the continent is increasingly grappling with, with issues of, of where do I fit in within this built environment? How, despite and in spite of all the historical and hegemonic baggage, am I, the individual, truly represented? And, and what should that representation be? Um, architecture, more than any other means of expression, mediates our relationship with, with the world and, and most importantly, our place within it. It's about belonging um, as much as it's about function and aesthetics. So I would imagine that these are the same queries that can be found today in, in the Caribbean. Um, especially now, given what happened last year with Barbados uh, following in the footsteps of Guyana, uh, Dominica, and Trinidad and Tobago, and also not to mention the, the special guest that Jamaica is currently entertaining uh, right now. Indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Livingston. And um, as you mentioned, those things. Let me point out that the Caribbean School of Architecture has been developing and has within its archive 33 years of investigation on the part of our students in terms of study tours, in terms of design projects. And what I really want to know one of these days is that we produce a seven volumes of Caribbean architecture as well. I'm definitely going to use those seven volumes in my teaching. Um, and I really look forward to the students having at their fingertips now precedents that they can turn to in their design studio. Oftentimes we see them taking precedents from Finland or Norway or 
And it's not that they're not wonderful architecture there, but that whole climatic and cultural condition is different. So you had a very intriguing visual in the start of your presentation with the multitude of things from other parts of the world and the dearth of materials on African architecture. So now we don't have as much of an excuse as we had before because we have seven volumes to probe. And maybe part two will come from volumes um, eight to 15 um, in, in the next seven years. <laughs> we certainly um, hope so. Yeah, right. Um, I think our timekeepers may or may not be signaling to us, but I think we're at the end of this discussion, which has been very illuminating. I'm pleased for the opportunity to have been able to talk with you. And I'm going to turn time back over to the team to deal with the audience, who I'm sure have many burning questions. Thank you, guys. So hi, everyone. I want to thank the panelists again for their riveting presentation. Thank you, Livingston, Adil, and you, Dennis. Um, I'm just going to take the questions back to the chat and ask from the persons in the audience to the panelists. So the first question is, what has been the feedback from the African Union about this book series? And has there been any feedback from architects throughout the continent? Uh, thank you very much uh, for that question, uh, Jana. Adil, would you like to go first? Um, well, the African Union, it's, uh, uh, we haven't had any feedback directly, but uh, of course we got a lot of feedback from, from uh, architects throughout the continent, um, which we're happy uh, has been very uh, positive um, because uh, one of the aims was also not just to uh, show the, the architecture of the African continent, but also to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the world in general. But uh, since there's little knowledge also of the, of the neighboring countries in many cases, a lot of architects uh, express their gratitude that um, now they, they, they have more material and, and information about what's going on just right, uh, right next door in the neighboring countries. Um, uh, so yeah, we're, we're happy to, to have had this positive feedback. And, and just to add um, to, to what Adil said, um, indeed, the feedback has been very in encouraging. In many cases, there have been people who had no idea this had been an ongoing multiple year journey. So when they saw the completed collection, they were really surprised. In, in some cases, some were asking, well, why, why wasn't I contacted uh, in, in, in this process? Why am I not a part of this? Um, but you know, the reality of this type of work is you, you just can't reach everybody. Um, and um, the, the, the landscape has changed drastically since work stopped on this project. So if you go to any one of these African countries, you will see structures that are not in the, in the, the volumes. Um, and so there have been questions of, you know, well, how come my building isn't in, or um, how come you missed out on, on, on this uh, a particular um, development or, or project. Um, but overall, we've, we've had very encouraging, positive feedback. Okay, thank you. And that question was from Damali. The next question from Omar um, was, is that, I was wondering if you find pragmatic differences in how different cultures collect and submit pieces of information and if the cultural differences were for you a challenge in that sense. Yes, or oh, Livingston, you wanna go first? Uh, I, I would say from, for me personally, um, not really. I, I'm quite familiar with uh, the, the, the continent, um, in, including all the uh, nuances of, of, of culture and, 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 and tradition. Um, not, not all of them, of, of course, um, but I, I had a, a fairly, um, um, a, a relatively uh, fluid way of, of, of navigating uh, through uh, the, the different nuances regarding trying to extract um, in, information. Okay, and last question from 
is uh, you spoke on Western biases, how much effort was placed in resisting those biases? For instance, it may not be useful to describe Nigerian traditional architecture as such because people like the Yoruba have spent, have, are spread among three or more countries, right? So this can misrepresent the history to potential readers and separate the architecture from the culture. So has emphasis been placed on the um, ethnic people, ethnic people more than that of the modern country borders? Adil, would you like to take that? Excellent question, because uh, which uh, we, we talked a lot about, uh, because um, as we talked about, we, we, we chose the, uh, the structure of, of uh, in today's nation states in this very arbitrary colonial borders. Um, and we tried to, to overcome this, um, uh, this problem because uh, indeed when we look at uh, architecture of the Sudan and Sahelian uh, region, for instance, and uh, Nigeria, and it's an excellent example as well, um, uh, the diversity in the, in the southern and uh, eastern western regions of, of Nigeria. So we tried to include these um, essays and background articles that um, are obviously placed in one of the country chapters, but try to look always beyond the borders. Um, uh, for instance, we have uh, uh, several articles on, on, on examples of um, Sahelian architecture, which, uh, which, which spans across uh, several countries uh, from, from, from starting from Senegal to yeah, almost Sudan. Um, and uh, the authors uh, whom we invite, invited, they were also asked to explicitly address this, uh, this issue that, uh, that this is going beyond uh, the, today's uh, nation states. But it's also interesting, I think we have several articles also um, that address the question of how this um, heritage is now being, I don't wanna say intr instrumentalized, but, but still sort of narrowed down in some cases to, uh, and used as some sort of national heritage, um, which is clearly a, a very recent invention and, um, or construct, let's say. And this is something that indeed needs to be uh, always the captain in, 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 in mind and uh, addressed throughout uh, when, you, when you discuss this kind of uh, traditional architecture. Of course, also the, the term traditional architecture itself can be challenged and, and questioned, which lots of authors also did in the first volume. but. Uh, yeah, it's always important to, to keep in mind that uh, the story is not always that clear that there's traditional Nigerian architecture indeed, uh, or, or traditional Beninese architecture or traditional Nigerian architecture, because there's uh, many overlaps, many uh, similarities, uh, which go beyond these modern borders. Right, thank you. And thanks again to Damoui, Omar and Angel for your questions. Um, I'll just hand it back over to Jordan to close. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, Jana, for moderating the audience Q&A. Um, I, I'd like to say extreme thanks to Adil Livingstone and Elizabeth for putting this presentation together and asking those questions. I think as Caribbean architects, we have a lot of work to do to sort of decolonize our education and really draw from uh, more relevant precedents um, as we think about how we design our own cities and our own experiences at home. Um, I'm eternally grateful that this compendium is available for um, consumption. I think it's a, a critical step in uh, changing narratives around architecture. Um, I think a part of why Alan City Lab puts on these events is to highlight architects from the Caribbean, um, because you know, often as mentioned with the art daily statistics, the media doesn't really um, identify or or appreciate the, the the advances or the ideas or discourse that's happening um, outside of the sort of hegemony of North America, Europe. Um, I think this is a really exciting conversation. I hope everyone took a lot away from it. I certainly did. I want to once again, thank you guys for agreeing to do this. I think it was a very rich presentation, a very rich conversation. And I hope, um, you know, the future of development in nations um, like ours um, can take a lot from what you guys have done, all the work that you guys have put in. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much.
Thank you for the opportunity and for having us. Thank, Thank you, Jorgon. All right, guys, um, we're going to close the session. Thank you all who made it. Um, really rich conversation. Thanks again. Um, we're going to close out now. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks.